25 past 11, having not seen uh, Jake and Jake since Monday morning. I thought, what better way to spend Friday evening than talking about, <laughs> uh, talking about Brexit? Um, but look, thanks, Mary, to you and the European Movement for facilitating this. It's, it's an opportune time for the meeting after uh, uh, the week that we've had. It's a good opportunity to, for me to hear the views of people in, uh, in Newton, uh, uh, from across in Helensboro, uh, and, and, and Merseyside too. Now, I, I, I suspect there'll be an expectation that I'm going to tell you what's going on and what's going to happen next. <laughs> I, I was hoping to harvest some of that, uh, some of that from you. But this is, this is, this is an unprecedented, uh, uh, volatile and very unpredictable time uh, in, in, in our politics. But I, had a, I have a strong sense of perspective uh, this morning when the first engagement I had was to present uh, the Legion d'Honneur, which had been awarded by the French Republic to a 93-year-old Royal Navy veteran in, in Mossbank. Um, he served uh, in the Battle of the Atlantic, and he had served on uh, D-Day. He went on teaching at <coughs> primary school, as many of you uh, will know. And that gave me uh, a sense of, uh, uh, despite the challenges and difficulties that we face, and inevitably, you know, they are tough. Uh, it pales into insignificance when you think of the challenges that uh, Dave Greenall's generation had, uh, their service, their sacrifice, their ability to put the national interest first. So not only was it a sense of perspective that it gave me, but I suppose a sense of uh, a, 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 a sense of inspiration too to have this 93-year-old man insisting that I called him Dave, but refusing to call me anything but Mr. McGinn and hoping that he hadn't caused me too much uh, trouble by having this was created in the fact that you know, we contributed to one of the most uh, important and uh, uh, fantastic uh, victories over uh, evil forces that, uh, that, that the world has ever known and that he's a good man and that he's from here. So uh, I, just, I just wanted to say that because I felt, um, I felt very humbled and, and, and very moved uh, by it. So look, let, let me just say a wee bit about where I've got to with all of this and, and, how, and how that's come about. So the Board of St Helens voted to leave in the referendum. Uh, I very strongly supported the Remain vote, but here by 58-42% and across the country by 52-48% uh, we voted to leave. Now, as a Member of Parliament, I receive a mandate at every general election, which is when, hopefully, uh, uh, the majority of people in St Helens North vote for me to represent them and, and make decisions on, on their, on your, on your family's behalf around everything from schools to hospitals to, to war and peace to pensions to social care. So I make those decisions based on what I think is in the best interest of people here, based on the fact that I'm a Labour MP who stands on a Labour manifesto. And the deal is that if people don't like the decisions I make, then they get to vote for somebody else at the next election. Now, the referendum was different because the referendum was what I call an instructive mandate, where on a specific issue, people said that this was the course of action that they wanted to take. Now, many of my colleagues in the Labour Party voted against triggering Article 50. I felt it was my, and I, and I understand that, and some of them did so because they thought it was in the best interest of the country, because they thought Article 50 had been triggered uh, too soon, which I also felt, and some of them because their constituencies voted to remain. But I felt I had a duty to fulfil my obligation to the vote, both here in St Helens and nationally, to vote to trigger Article 50. But I was very clear when I did that, that following it, that that was my obligation fulfilled and that I was back to being a representative. And in terms of the sort of Brexit that we had or the approach I would take to Brexit, uh, I would do what I thought was in the best interest of my friends and my neighbours uh, uh, here in, in St Helens North and also in the, in the best interest of the country. And I'm going to level with you on this, that I have a vested interest. You know, I live here, you know, my wife works here, my children go to school here. You know, their future, like your and your family's future, uh, is, is my future and is, is important, is important uh, to me too. So following that, uh, and having been closely involved in the debate, both within the Labour Party and within Parliament as a whole. Uh, I supported uh, moves to uh, stay in the single market and in the customs union. Uh, I think, broadly speaking, uh, the Labour Party position has been, uh, has been one that has evolved, but that fundamentally is about, if I'm being candid, balancing the fact that we are 
the only truly national party left now in the sense that we have seats where 70% of people voted to remain and 70% of people voted to leave and there is a political balance that you have to get right with that but also in terms of acknowledging the fact that you know, we oppose this government we oppose what it has done over the last eight years here in terms of uh, swinging cuts to public services not just a lack of investment but I would argue a disinvestment in our northern working class uh, communities and also in their approach to Brexit now of course then we had the general election in 2017 where the Prime Minister thought that by going to the country she would achieve a landslide majority and of course history tells a very different tale so since then she has been as you and know, reliant on the DUP and in hop to held ransom by her uh, her right wing backbenchers who want the hardest possible Brexit and they come at it from an ideological standpoint. Now I understand some people in St Helens still feel very strong that we should leave the European Union, but all I'd say to people is do you really think that people like Boris Johnson and Jacob Rees Mogg have any identification with people who live in this town in Newton, who live in this borough? Do you really think that people like that have any of our interests of our care about young people here, care about our older people being able to retire and live in dignity, to care about the future of jobs in the local economy here, because I don't believe that they do. So my inclination is that whatever they say is the polar opposite of what we should do. Uh, and so that, I suppose, reached, uh, reached its climax this week when the deal came before Parliament. Now, this is difficult for me because, you know, I am, you know, I am a Labour Party uh, politician. I'm very uh, proud of my own background in the in the trade union movement, but I am fundamentally uh, moderate in my approach to politics. I don't. I, I like to try and be able to build consensus. I'm rooted in socialist values, but I'm pragmatic enough to know that sometimes you don't get everything you want, and you have to uh, make make compromises. But the compromise that I couldn't make with this day was the fact that it would make people here poorer. Yep. And I did not come into politics. You know, I did not move to live in this community. I did not decide to seek to represent this community to make anybody in it poorer. And I'm not going to do that. And neither am I going to apologise for having that <coughs> as my fundamental standpoint in my approach to Brexit. Or in fact any 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 other issues. Uh, I thought it was a bad deal for an awful lot of reasons. Uh, it offers nothing on workers' rights. Now, anybody who trusts this government to bind in the workers' rights that have been so hard won through our membership of the European Union is completely deluding themselves when you think about things like uh, the Trade Union Act that was brought forward. When you think about the attack on in-work benefits. Mm. The people who I see in my surgery, you know, married couples, the mum and dad who are trying to do the right thing by going out to work to set an example to their kids that that's how you earn and progress in life are telling me that they don't see each other and they can't make ends meet. You know, there's a deep unfairness that exists in this country and if you're asking me to trust the Tory government to mitigate any of that then I'm afraid I can't do it on <laughs> environmental protections, on consumer rights, on our future trading relationship. None of that yeah. was resolved or decided by this. <laughs> now you've heard a lot of noise about the backstop. Uh, it won't have escaped anybody's attention that I am from Northern Ireland. Uh, I grew up on the border. This conversation has gone down a cul-de-sac of trade and the economy and technological solutions. Actually what it's about is people and place and communities and the sense that we have made incredible progress over the last 25 years where we've broken down barriers between north and south between communities in Northern Ireland and that this whether it's you know physical or psychological re-erects barriers and that is not a good thing but fundamentally my view has always been that you will need some sort of special arrangements and special provision for Northern Ireland so the backstop is not is not the major issue or major concern for me nor do I think in all honesty again being very frank, is it for is it for the Labour Party? And I admire the newfound commitment to loyal Ulster from Conservative MPs who have never shown a single interest in Northern Ireland, its people or anything about it. But my priority is this community. My priority is getting the right Brexit deal for uh, 
for my constituents in St. Helens North and for the, the communities that live here. And here's my worry about that. You see, people say, and I understand people are frustrated, and people say to me, why can't you just get on with it? Why can't you just agree? Well, you see, you can't have both ways, because if people want politicians to be reflective of the communities they represent, then the truth is, the people of this country are divided as well about the way forward. And when somebody who wants to leave with no deal says to me, why can't you just get on with it? I say, OK, well, we will get on with it. And what we do by getting on with it is staying in the European Union. Or when I say to someone who tells me that they want to stay in the European Union and this is a disaster for the country and why can't we just sort it out? I say, well, we will sort it out then. We'll just leave with no deal. You see, everybody wants it to be sorted out, but they want it to be sorted out in the way that they want, not in the way that can command the consensus across the country. So I have, having, you know, wrestled with this, uh, I have come to the conclusion that failing, um, failing to get a general election, which I think given the arithmetic of Parliament, given the confidence that's applied, what we, we, we saw this week, failing to get a, a general election, which I think is now, is now unlikely, uh, Parliament can't reach consensus. So I have reluctantly come to the conclusion that we, that we may need to go back to the people. And I don't do that to attempt in any underhand way to get us to stay in the European Union by the back door or default. If we have a second referendum, I think there should be an option for Remain, and I would be very vociferously and strongly campaigning for that. But you know, when I when I when I sort of did my Friday Friday um, morning routine a couple of weeks ago, which is you know barbers, butchers, and bookies. Uh, in Earl's town, uh, people there who are leavers told me that you know they have come to the conclusion that maybe the only way to resolve this is to go back to the people. Now they'll be voting to leave; they won't have changed their minds. A great many of them, now lots of them will, because my argument is it's not about saying that people were wrong or 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 you know the pe people uh, people voted in the way they did for anything other than genuinely held uh, views about the best uh, future for the country. But I think if we're being honest with ourselves and each other, uh, people voted in 2016, those who voted to leave, they voted for a concept, leaving the European Union. But now, two years on, we've seen the practicalities of that. Now, in some ways, this stands up some of the arguments that was made by the Leave campaign, because we've actually had 40 years where we are completely intertwined with, or enveloped is another word, you know, European Union law around everything. It affects every facet of our lives and you can't just disentangle yourself from that by having a, a clean break or, uh, or, 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 or a cliff edge. It just doesn't work like that. You know, this is, this is complicated. So I suppose uh, as of tonight, uh, that, that, that's my view. Uh, look, I, I am up for being persuaded about, about other solutions. You know, I'm up for talking about Customs unions, Norway 2.0, you know, uh, plus, plus. Uh, you know I'm, I'm, I'm up for talking about that. But you see in my heart of hearts, like, I have to be straight with you about this, I don't think that any deal we get is better than the deal we have now. And you see, fundamentally, like, I can't say to people that I think, I think it is or I think that, or I think that, uh, or I think that it will be. But I'm, but I'm up for this, and I'm up for having the, I'm up for having the conversation about it. And I suppose fundamentally, I feel that if Parliament can't agree, then we do, uh, we do need to seriously consider uh, uh, going to the people um, and asking them to make the final decision on uh, on the Prime Minister's deal uh, or or staying in the European Union.